Welcome, church. Oh. Praise God. Welcome everyone here. New Testament Christian Church, Dallas, Texas. Tuesday evening Bible study. I pray that everyone is doing well. Amen. I pray that God is blessing your household. God is blessing your heart. God is blessing your spirit. God is blessing your mind. That God is blessing every portion of your life. Amen. I'm thankful for this day. Um, God has been good to me, and I pray that he has been good to you just as well. Just as well, my friend, just as well. We're in the book of John, chapter 17. Amen. That's where we're going to begin, chapter 17, verse 1. But first, we are going to pray. Dear loving Father, we thank you for this very time to open up the bread of life, O oh God. We ask that you bless, O oh God, the heart, mind, soul, and body and spirit, O oh Lord, of the ones that are here, O oh God. Bless us in every aspect of our life, O oh God, and strength as well, O oh God, and knowledge and wisdom. Open our hearts to receive your divine word, dear God, that we may apply it to our lives, O oh God, apply it. O oh Lord, to our walk in Christ Jesus while we're here on earth. O oh God, until we get home to you in heaven. In Jesus Christ's wonderful name, Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. Praise God. John chapter 17, 1 7. We're moving up. Give you a chance to get there. And just to give you a little backdrop, this is. Um, the prayer of Christ and Christ is going to pray here John chapter 17 and it reads it says these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven so it mentions the position of Christ the posture of Christ his supplication this prayer that was about to go forth to the heavenly father he said he lifted up his eyes okay to heaven um we usually pray westerners we usually pray with our head bowed folks usually pray with their bowing of their head things of that nature but jesus prayed at that time with the customs of prayer common uh in his own day it says he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And John chapter 11, uh, 41 reflects that when it says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes right there. He lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, uh, certain times of the day they pray in different parts of the house for different situations and it has a certain different effect on them it just seems like you know um, that you hear things about a prayer closet or a position of prayer and it all does make a difference because you don't want to be irritated uh, while you're praying or bothered while you're praying you want to be comfortable amen and Christ that's how he prayed then. He was comfortable in lifting up his eyes to heaven and praying. And also Psalms 123, 1 talks about, the psalmist says, Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. So Jesus looking up, praying, as it said, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. He spoke lifting up to heaven and he spoke with he's praying with faith he's praying with 
confidence. This is the mindset he has and the mindset that we have when we bring things to God. We need to pray having the uh, faith. We need to pray having the confidence. Amen. And that's how Christ was. And he was praying with uh, the mindset of the soon-to-come victory of defeating death, hell, and the grave. But he knew his time was about to uh, come across to that. So, And Jesus prays concerning himself amongst other things, which I'll mention a little bit later. Okay, Jesus prayed unto God the Father. Amen. Christ said, Father, the hour is come. Now, the hour is come, Christ, that's a lot happened during that time when Christ, this begins actually the preliminaries before Christ uh, uh, gets crucified. So Christ makes the comparison, amen, he says, my hour is come. So what is the hour? People think 60 minutes, everything happens in that hour, everything is going to uh, transpire in that hour, but to Christ, this was all these things were going to happen just rushing to him all at once. Amen. Father, the hour has come. So Christ makes a comparison of his arrest. Okay, they arrest him. Amen. Him being judged. Him being beaten. Him being whipped. Him being scourged. Him being having his uh, uh, beard plucked out. Peter denying him. Him talking to Pilate. Things of that nature. Okay, this is not happen in the hour, but this is Christ comparing him saying, Father, the hour has come. These things are going to, that's how he identifies that as all those events taking place. Could have been a whole lot of time, 10, 12, 20 hours. Could have been that long of a time. But that all takes place. So Christ makes a comparison of his arrest, him being judged, him being beaten, him being crucified. And he sees it as an hour, you know, uh, you can work eight hours, but it can seem like 90 hours. You know, it can seem like a very long time. And, you know, and then even though it's a very short time. And then we, we even say that sometimes. So Christ says this hour that he's talking about is all those things that is about to take place in his life. You know, he says his hour has come. And it's about to happen. So, Father, the hour has come. What to glorify the say says the hour has come. He said, Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So Christ was about to see death, okay, amen. But his death was going to be a fruitful death. Okay? A fruitful death. That's amazing right there. In fact, uh, that's the title of the message this Sunday for Easter service. A fruitful death and it was about to be fruitful for us it was about to be fruitful for those who weren't saved it was about to be fruitful for all those who uh, uh, the, the comforter that was talked about so we can say this a lot of things in our life that seems like a lost a loss l-o-s-s -S, or seems like a loss to us could be that dying of that thing or that going away of that thing Amen. Could be fruitful to us in some other aspects in our life. Amen. Amen. Something has it. Something has to die. They're no different than the seed being. We know no different than the seed being planted into the ground. Amen. That thing that has to die, right, for some to sprout. So how does that work as far as salvation? We die to our old ways, right? And we come into the new birth in Christ Jesus. So uh, death is fruitful, but people don't see it always like that. Losing something or someone can be fruitful, but a lot of times we don't visualize it like that. We don't want to lose anything. We don't want to lose anybody. We don't want anybody to depart from us. We don't want this thing to depart from us. And God is saying some of those things in our life that we've been holding on to, and, and, and just like got our grips on it, Christ says, the bigger blessing, the blessing I really have for you uh, 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 is on the other side of that if you let that thing go, if you let that person go, or if you let go of that. No different than a person letting go of an addiction. When that addiction dies, the fruit, okay, 
outside of that addiction, and when that addiction dies, the fruit from that death and that addiction, amen, is going to come to the surface. It will take place. It will transpire. So all of you, if you let sweets die in your life or some type of inordinate or inordinary type of eating die in your life, your body will be fruitful as far as health wise. So amen, some things have to die, amen, so some things can come alive. So Christ, was a, he says his hour is come and it's going to be a fruitful death for us, amen, and for the kingdom of God. Because Christ is to go back home. He's, he gets to go back home and, and be where he desires to be. So this prayer shows also, this prayer, John chapter 17, it's lengthy prayer, long prayer, serious, earnest prayer that Christ prays. Amen. It describes and mentions and has uh, uh, undertones or little backdrops of the rich relationship between the Son and the Father. Okay, really rich relationship. This prayer of Jesus Christ, it's genuine. It's authentic. It was directed repeatedly toward God the Father. And it concerned a bunch of other subcategories in that just as well in that prayer. Okay, uh, concerning some of the, the finished work of Christ on earth in that prayer in John chapter 17. Also, it concerns the and recognizes the disciples, okay? The ones that Christ fed along the way. The one that Christ, the ones that Christ nurtured, okay, along the way. The ones that Christ took up under his wing along the way during his ministry on earth. Those folks are mentioned. The disciples are mentioned in this prayer. The Heavenly Father is mentioned in uh, uh, this prayer. Glory is mentioned in this prayer toward the Son and toward the Father. So concerning and recognizing the disciples as ones picking up where Christ left off or is about to leave off is mentioned in this prayer. They're going to have to pick up where Christ left off. Amen. Concerning the work of the kingdom is mentioned in this prayer. Concerning keeping away from evil and concerning, here's a real big one here, I, I believe, is the intercession for the disciples. Christ is going to mention them. Why would you mention the disciples when you're praying to the Father about the will being done, about the, uh, 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 the Son being glorified? Amen. Because Christ had made mention of the disciples uh, 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 about the Heavenly Father. And also this prayer concerns Christ making a way for eternal life. Verse 2, as it says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, Christ given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Amen. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So Christ, through his ministry, Clearly made the Father known to the disciples. Clearly made the, the relationship of the Father and the Son also known to the disciples. You can make a person known to somebody, but do you make that relationship the way you have the intimate relationship that you have with that person known to that individual? No person really sometimes does it. Okay, or the relationship that you have with that individual. A person does it, but Christ made it known to them. Those that wanted to know, wanted to understand, and wanted to learn. He made it known to them. Verse 4 says, or let me read verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And he tells them right there, hey, he in this prayer, he's the one that has sent me. And now, O Father, he says, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So he says, hey, before the foundation of the earth was even made, there was some glory going on between you and me, Heavenly Father. Will you glorify me with that same glory 
okay, even though I'm on earth right now. So Christ remembering and reminiscing of the glory, amen, that was before the foundation of the earth. He tastes that in his heart. He tastes that in his soul. He tastes that in his spirit. No different than you tasting the first time when you got saved and God was showing up in your life as he still is today and everything was fresh and was new. You still taste that and you were on fire for God. Remember, you were on real super, super duper extra you know, bungee jumping, roller coaster, jump off the cliff for God type of fire. You know, that's how you were feeling at the time when you got saved and you ran around. I'm saved. Life is new. Everything. I got no more chains, no more bondage. You know, Christ could taste that same glory, that same feeling, okay, in heaven. And he says that. I can taste it. Oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory Okay, amen, which I had, okay, with thee. That glory that we had, I had before, with thee, what, before the world was. He's talking about that, amen. And sometimes he said, I want to get back to there. I want to experience that again. And maybe some of us need to get to that point, back to that. Oh, God's taking me down the road right now. Amen. This is off the subject of the Bible study, but meant to be. Maybe we need to get back to the point to where we were like that with God. Where everything was on fire and just ignited for God and we were all in. And we weren't relaxed and we weren't reserved. And we were gun ho for God. Amen. And we remember those times. Remember that time where everything was shouting and dancing and praising and worshiping. And your prayer life was stellar. And everything, just everything was stellar. Your reading life and God's word was stellar. Your meditation in the Lord was stellar. Your worship was stellar. Your giving to God was stellar. Everything was top notch. And you fully dedicating everything to God. And you reminisce about that now because guess what? You're no longer there. We can get back there though. Now back to John chapter 17 verse 6. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. See, he says, hey, I've made folks known about you. I didn't put you in the closet. I didn't put you in the box. I made mention of you. I made it clear to folks, black and white, that I am related to you, and I am known of you, and you are known of me, and I explained to them plainly. In fact, the last three or four chapters mentions uh, of John chapter 17, 16, and 15, and 14, and 13, all the way to 12, mention about the relationship between the Heavenly Father and the Son over and over and over. So they, you, they can't play dumb that he hasn't mentioned the Father to them. He says, I have manifested, I have made known thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, okay? They were yours first, God. And then he says, and thou gavest them me. And then he turned them over to me under my stewardship, under my mentorship, okay? Under my watch. Amen. So, Lord, Heavenly Father, trust in Christ with souls. And they have kept thy word. So, he tells them, they kept the word. So, Christ, here, Christ intertwines in this prayer. He intertwines intercession prayer for and with and of the disciples here. They're mentioned here. So, he's like, Heavenly Father, take note of these individuals because I'm coming back home. And these folks are going to be left here. And take note of them because, Heavenly Father, I uh, made them known, okay, of you. And this, talk about intercession prayer real quick. In Romans 8.34 it says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Amen. Christ making it mention now. Amen. When you're in prayer to when you're in prayer to the Heavenly Father and you mention people and you mention names and you mention places and you mention uh, other people's uh, family and family and other people's of other families, things of that nature, that's you're interceding for them. Just the fact you mention them, amen, in your prayer, whether 
uh, uh, no matter if it's good, bad, or indifferent of what your supplication may be about that individual, you're still missing them in your prayer. Amen. Want God to make a difference in their life, your life. Amen. And hopefully spiritually in their life just as well. And Hebrews 7.25 talks about intercession also as Jesus Christ is. It says, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come. Amen. Unto God by him. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Let's go to verse 7, John chapter 17, verse 7. Now they have known, talk about disciples, that now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are thee. So he tells them, they have the knowledge, they have the understanding, they have a working, so I gave them some working active information, amen, that whatever you gave me, I gave them. And they know where the source is, and the source is you. So Christ is letting, uh, in this prayer, letting the Heavenly Father know all the details, okay, of what he has inserted and spoon-fed the disciples. He's relating it in this prayer to the Heavenly Father. Amen. He says, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So he says, The disciples are aware of you and aware that you are are the source for revelation for feeding for giving you are the source of all christ lets the heavenly father know that in this prayer he mentions that amen he says for in verse 8 for i have given unto them the words i give them the very nutrition he says which thou gavest me what you gave me i gave them okay and what i give you online and here in person Okay, it should come from Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is getting it from the Heavenly Father. Amen. It should come from Grandma or from, or from somebody from the street. I need to give you what God is giving me. Okay, and there's no two ways about it. And you need to give folks what God is giving you through Jesus Christ. There's no two ways about it. Not the, don't give them the, the uh, you know, the, what's, what they call that? The, they got those shops that have the, the bootleg version. They bootleg clothes, bootleg Louis Vuitton, and bootleg, uh, 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 you know, hats and shoes and watches. And Don't give them the bootleg version of the gospel. Give them the gospel. Give them the gospel. And that's what we should do is give the gospel. He said, Christ says, hey, I gave them what you gave me. There's no excuse for them. Okay, I fed them accordingly and properly. As I have should, as I was told to do, and I did. He says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. They didn't reject them, they didn't spit them out. Okay, maybe a little tough at times, but they have received them and have known surely, without a doubt. He says, well, Surely, this is a fact. He's declaring the fact, surely, that I came out from thee. Okay? So he says, with no denying, they know of you, of me, my source, your source, everything. They know it all, okay? And they have believed that thou didst send me. He's saying they're all in. They're all in to, to go to work. They're all in to help build, build the kingdom. They're all in to let you guide them through me. They're all in submissive and surrendering hearts to work for you and in you and with you. That's man cooperating with the Spirit of God, and that's how it always should be. The Spirit of God should always, uh, uh, man should always cooperate with the Spirit of God. No two ways about that. And he says, this group here, they cooperate. Now, all church members should be like that. All preachers should be like that, right? We should all cooperate with God's Spirit. If we're all cooperating with God's Spirit, and we claim to all be cooperating with God's Spirit, then we should be cooperating with everybody else in the church. But point made, let's move on. Verse 9, John 17, 9. I pray for them. Okay? I pray not for the world. He's, he says, I'm praying for the ones I invested in. I'm praying for the ones I spent time with 
and sp they spend time with me. I'm praying for the ones that listen to me and, and are going to uh, uh, be obedient to my commandments and my word. He goes, I'm praying for the ones that I handheld, that you gave to me, that I nurtured, and they stuck around, they stayed around, and they're faithful, and they're diligent. He says, I'm praying for them. He said, I pray not for the world. I pray for the worldly folk. I pray for the ones that's trying to kill me or want to kill me or want to kill the disciples or against your kid. I'm not praying. I'm praying for them. I'm investing in them. I've heard this said before. Uh, say, hey, Pastor Champion, invest in the ones that are that have your vision. Invest in the ones that are all in. Invest in the ones that are all in. Don't invest in the ones that don't want to be in your team. Don't invest with the, in the ones that want to fight you all the time. Don't invest in those that want to buck up and kick up. Don't invest in those. Invest in the ones, amen, that want to be down with the team. You soak your energy into those. Like, wow. Ain't I supposed to be loving everybody, though? Invest in the ones as Christ did. Here, he says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. You go act worldly, I can't pray for you. you go talk worldly, live worldly, live on God, I can't, I can't help you. He says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. So guess what, preacher, uh, minister, pastor, whoever, me, you, anybody else, uh, 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 God will give you folks to deal with. He'll give you folks to care after and to look after and to feed and to give the gospel to. Amen. And not all of you going to be feeling favorable toward. If God gave them to you to work with, then guess what? They must be workable in God's eyes. He says in verse 10, and all mine are thine. All, all mine, uh, he's saying, that Christ says, the gods are yours just as well. And thine are mine, vice versa. Yours are mine, mine are yours. Co-equal. There's no, we're not going to argue about this. Okay? He says that I am glorified in them. And verse 11 says, and now I am no more in the world. He's checking out. He, he, he's getting, I, he's on his way. He already got one foot in heaven. He, he got both feet in heaven. Just his body's there. He's already, he's on his way out. And now I am no more in heaven. And you know what? Some of us need to be on our way out from some things. Some of us are in a place that we need to be on our way out. We need to check out of that position that we're in. He says, and now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. So he's saying, making a petition in his prayer for the disciples' intercession. I need you to keep these folks because they're going to be in this world. They're not going to be of this world, and they shouldn't be of this world, but they're going to be in this world, Father. And I need you to look after them along with me, those that thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. He says they need to act in unison together, in tandem together, as me and you, Heavenly Father, work together. He's saying, this relationship, Father, that me and you have, okay, they need to have the same relationship amongst themselves, the same relationship amongst me also, all on the same playing field. And that's how it should be. No big eyes or little U's. Everybody's on the same playing field, accomplishes the same will, and that's accomplishing the same will, the will of the Heavenly Father. He says in 13, he says right here, and none of them... While I was with them in the world, I kept them in, in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, Judas. Okay, we know that. That the scripture might be fulfilled. He says, 13, And now come I to thee. I'm coming to you, Heavenly Father. And these things I speak in the world. Okay? That they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. They need this fulfillment, needs to be the joy, my joy, filled in themselves. I have given them thy word. I fed them. He mentions that again. I've given them thy word, and the disciples have no excuse not to share the gospel. And we don't have an excuse if we know the word. We have the word of God to not to share the gospel. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. The world hates truth. The world hates truth. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, 
even as I am not of the world. He said they hated them because they're not of the world. Amen. They hated me because I'm not of the world. And guess what, my friend? People will hate you just as well because guess what? You're not of the world. It doesn't matter. You're not of the world and your speech will betray you. As the one guy said to Peter, hey, you're, the way you talk, you talk like you've been around Christ. You don't talk like you're from the hood. Uh, your speech betrays you. Then Peter tried to sound like them and began to curse and things of that nature. And uh, no, uh, he, and it should be that because we're a peculiar people. We stand out differently. Our verbiage, the way we talk, the way we carry ourselves, things of that nature, body gestures. Yes, we should be different in every single form. Our thought process. Amen. God help us. Right? Amen. We're not in the world. Okay. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're not. We're not living worldly. No, that's not. The, that's not what we should be doing. We need to stand out. He says, "I have given them thy word." Amen. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Look at that. When you work for God, here's you need to need this. I'm gonna read that one more time, and Holy Ghost help me to explain this. John 17, 15 says, 17, 15 says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Okay, so right there in that frame, you work for God. There's no escape in the work for God. Just do the work of God. He says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. I need you to keep them from the evil in the world. Don't take them out till it's time to take them out. In the meantime, while we're in the world, we need to do the work of the Heavenly Father. At the same time, Christ is interceding for us to say, I need you to protect the ones that you gave me, and the ones that were yours, and the ones that are mine, and the ones that are thine. So we should be at work for God, trusting that this prayer is in effect right now that Christ has prayed that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. The same way the disciples be kept from the evil, the same way I'm applying that to my life and your life just as well that serve God, that he keeps us from the evil in the world. That prayer, John 17, 15, I'm, I'm attached it to my life. Okay? You need to attach it to your life. Amen. If I'm living down here earth, on earth, Lord, you need to use me the way you need to use me, but keep me from the evil in this world. Keep me from the evil, Lord. We need to pray to God. Keep us from the evil. Do you see the little thing you've heard before that the three little monkeys see no evil, speak no evil, heal no evil? That would be great. Some people have that. I wouldn't even say it's an ability because they're handicapped. They can't see any evil. They can't hear any evil. They don't speak any evil. They don't even know any evil. I don't even know if they know any evil. But you're working for God? Guess what? Christ has already prayed. Keep these disciples from the evil. In the same way in the fight to our lives, that the Lord keep us from evil. I pray that the Lord keeps you from evil, your household from evil. Amen. And anything attached to you from evil. Praying for your service this Thursday and this Sunday. Amen. All those that are listening and wherever you're at. Amen. And pray for us here in Dallas, Texas, in TCC. Pray for our services just as well. We'll be having our Sunday service. Amen. In the park in Dallas at Everglade Park. Amen. We're going to have a good time. We're going to have open air preaching and singing and worship. Amen. Fun food and fellowship. And the Father in Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Service Thursday, 730. Be there. Like us on Facebook and share. I love you. And God bless you. Amen.